Welcome back to the final part of our Money in Banking video series. In part one, you have learned how banks create money. In part two, you saw how an adverse shock is amplified through the liquidity and disinflation spiral. Part three then showed how redistributive monetary policy can mitigate these adverse spirals by affecting asset prices. Now, in part four, we study economic stability in a world in which the government might default on its debt. We introduce the diabolic loop or doom loop and three dominance concepts. Finally, we will put everything together to get the full picture of the analysis. Economic stability can be broken up in three different stability concepts. Financial stability, the absence of a financial crisis in the financial sector. Price stability, the absence of very high inflation or deflation. And fiscal debt sustainability, the absence of any default risk in government debt. That is, the government honors its debt. Prior to the Great Recession, policymakers thought it would be best to assign a separate authority to each stability concept. This assumed that one can treat all stability concepts separately isolated from each other. The three authorities are fiscal authorities, the central bank, and financial regulators. How would you assign these authorities? With fiscal authority, it's obvious that it is the government's job to pay back its debt. The central bank is a little trickier to place. Is the central bank in charge of price or financial stability? Initially, central banks were founded to take care of financial stability. But starting in the 1980s, the central banks became more and more focused on price stability. And financial regulators would be in charge of financial stability. Let's rearrange things and form a matrix chart. We will return to this matrix again and again. The diagonal elements stress the clear assignment of tasks, while the off-diagonal elements stress the interaction between the stability concepts. In part two, we have seen the close interaction between financial stability and price stability. After an adverse shock, undercapitalized banks shrink the balance sheets, causing disinflationary pressure. An interest rate cut leans against it. It increases the value of long-dated assets, like the government bonds, and thereby recapitalizes the banks. But what happens if the government debt is not sustainable, and the government might not honor its debt? We have to generalize our framework a bit. We now depart from the assumption that government debt is always safe. Let us introduce the fear that government bonds might default. Looking at the balance sheet of the government, you can see that the government's long-term bonds are on the liability side. The present value of all future taxes minus the expenditures counterbalance these liabilities. With a negative shock, government tax revenues go down. If government expenditures don't follow and also decline, investors might be unsure whether the government is able to honor its debt obligations. It is useful to distinguish between three forms of dominance. Fiscal dominance, monetary dominance, and financial dominance. Fiscal dominance refers to the unwillingness of the government to balance its long-run budget. One way out is to print more money to balance the budget through inflation. But under monetary dominance, the central bank is unwilling to print more money to balance the budget. Fiscal authorities, that is the government, and monetary authorities, the central bank, play a game of chicken. If both fiscal authorities and the central bank insist on their dominance, then a default of government debt cannot be ruled out. If, for example, part of the debt is inflation indexed, foreign currency denominated, or the country is a member of a currency union. The question then arises, where the banking sector, which holds some of the long-term bonds, has enough equity 
such that it is able to absorb losses that arise from the default of the government bonds. Under the third concept, financial dominance, banks are unwilling to raise equity or are deliberately undercapitalized. Their fear that otherwise losses will be pushed onto them. If banks are undercapitalized, a default of government bonds would cause large contagion and ripple effects to the real economy. Let's return to our matrix chart, which highlights the three stability concepts and the three authorities. We are now able to put all the pieces together. Previously, we have looked at how an adverse shock to end borrowers triggered an initial decline in banks' assets. This led to a decline in equity and banks extended less credit and engaged in fire sales of assets, which further decreased asset values and equity. The liquidity spiral caused financial instability. Also, as banks engaged in fire sales of assets and shrank the balance sheets, the inside money on the liability side fell. This lowered total money supply in the economy. In addition, as banks diversify less idiosyncratic risk, individuals want to hold more cash, which increases money demand. Both the decline in money supply and the increase in money demand causes disinflationary pressures. And as the value of money increased through this inflation, banks' liabilities increased and the equity shrank even further. Banks responded by reducing their credit supply to the real economy. This reduced overall economic activity, GDP went down, and then the government lost tax revenue. And all of this made the long-term government bond more risky. Now coming back to dominance. Under fiscal dominance, the government is reluctant to reduce long-term expenditures or raise taxes. Under monetary dominance, the central bank is reluctant to print additional money to create senior rich for financing government expenditures. If neither party gives up in this game of chicken, represented by our chart by a line going through both fiscal and monetary dominance boxes, the default risk in particular when part of the debt is inflation indexed, goes up. This lowers the value of the long-term government bonds. So now, unlike before, the initial adverse shock to banks' assets translate into an additional shock to the long-term government bond. Losses are not offset by capital gains on long-term government bonds, but amplified by additional losses. Under financial dominance, banks don't raise new equity but rather cut their credit supply, with less credit going to the real economy, a diabolic spiral between the financial sector risk and the government bond default risk emerges. Both banks and the government become more risky and they feed on each other, leading to higher risk premia. Of course, the central bank could have given up its monetary dominance and agreed to print more money. Graphically, this is represented by a line bypassing the monetary but not the fiscal dominance box. This turns off the diabolic loop but leads to an inflationary force, especially when structural reforms are needed because the economy was hit by a permanent shock. This inflationary force could counterbalance the disinflationary force coming from the debt disinflationary spiral, which in turn comes from the interaction between price and financial stability. So essentially, you have two forces, a disinflationary one and an inflationary one, pushing in different directions. However, these two forces are difficult to balance in crisis times. The system is very unforgiving of small mistakes in a crisis. It is like riding a bike. When the economy grows, balancing these two forces, one disinflationary, and one inflationary is not very difficult, just like riding a bike at a reasonable speed. But if the economy slows down, just like a bike slows down, it becomes increasingly difficult to balance both forces. Just as it is hard to predict whether the biker might fall on one side or the other, so it is difficult to predict whether the economy will drift off the deflationary or the inflationary side. 
This might explain why inflation expectations are so different in times of crisis. Some people emphasize inflation, while others fear disinflation. Ideally, one would never like to get even close to situations in which all three of the spirals are active. The best monetary policy is preventive monetary policy. Hence, optimal policy is forward-looking and includes early warning signals. It is important to follow credit growth to see whether imbalances are building up in the financial sector, in addition to the non-financial corporate sector, as was the case in Japan in the 1980s, or in the housing sector, as was the case in the United States in the 2000s. Credit and monetary quantities can point out where imbalances are building up. Imbalances are likely to emerge when volatility is low, since people take on more leverage, and when there are many financial innovations. Quantity constraints like loan-to-value ratios and debt-to-income ratios, in addition to other macroprudential tools, are important to ensure that the three spirals outlined in this lecture are not driving an economy into the ground. Let me conclude. First, we have seen that liquidity spirals amplify initial shocks. Systemic risk arises, risk that is endogenously generated by the system itself. Second, financial instability spills over to price instability through the disinflationary spirals. Disinflation, in turn, worsens financial stability. To limit systemic risk, monetary policy takes on a redistributive role. Within monetary policy, we contrasted the money view with the credit view. The former focuses on monetary aggregates on the liability side of the bank's balance sheets. The latter on credit aggregates on the bank's asset side. Fiscal debt sustainability issues arise when there is a fear that the government cannot honor its own debt obligations. The diabolic spiral or loop emerges. An increase in banks' risk also increases the risk of government debt, and vice versa. Under such circumstances, central banks might have a difficult time balancing the strong inflationary and disinflationary forces. In sum, good economic policies take these interactions into account, but importantly, are forward-looking in order to stay away from the strong interactive forces that link the three stability concepts, financial stability, price stability, and fiscal debt sustainability. Further information on this and related research can be found on Yuli Sanikov's website or on my website under Macro, Money and Finance. Thank you for watching. Until next time, Auf Wiedersehen.